Well, what can you see? What can you see? I wonder how you get on with those um, those kind of optical illusions where you have a picture, but it's really two pictures. And uh, you know, the, the idea is which picture can you see first? Um, there's the, the one with the old lady and the young lady. There's the one with, with the vase and the two faces. And there are some other ones too. I had to have a giggle this week. I found a website um, which claimed that it could tell my personality depending on which picture I saw first. I was quite revealing. Apparently, I'm, I'm quirky and creative. I'm a free spirit. I'm a curious and kind soul. And yet, despite all that, I'm also unique, apparently. Uh, it's amazing how much self-discovery I can find in one picture. What can you see? Joking it apart, um, what do we see as we look around us? Do we see uh, just the circumstances of our lives, or do we see the Lord beyond? What can we see in this room? What can we see at home this evening? What will we see? What will you see tomorrow, wherever you are? What what do we see in our country? What do we see in our broken world? Today's Bible reading in Exodus is full of seeing. Six times it says somebody sees or looks or watches. It's full of seeing. But what do we see in our Bible reading? Uh, We see actually something a little bit like those pictures. We see one picture, but from three different perspectives. And from the different perspectives, we see different things. Let's take them one at a time. The first perspective is this, failure. We see first the failure of Moses. Remember where we're up to? Uh, God promised old man Abraham and his son Isaac and his son Jacob uh, many things. God promised to to bless them uh, with many descendants in a land of their own. And now over 400 years, those descendants have been in Egypt and they've multiplied greatly. So fast, the Pharaoh is scared of them. And you remember Pharaoh is trying to control them uh, with slavery and with killing uh, the baby boys. Uh, But a Hebrew baby called Moses has escaped, uh, and uh, Moses is now growing up under Pharaoh's nose in his palace. Today's Bible reading begins, it says elsewhere in the Bible, it begins when Moses is 40 years old. So we skip a big chunk of his life. He's 40 years old. It's a good age to be. But the first perspective in this episode is failure. The failure of Moses. Look down, would you? Exodus chapter 2 and verse 11. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were, and he watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Moses, the fighter. Somehow Moses knows he's Uh, or he seems at least to know he's not an Egyptian, he's a Hebrew. And perhaps for the first time in his life, we don't know, Moses gets, I guess, into his chariot, and he rides out to the kind of labor camp where the Hebrews are building these great cities of Python and Ramses, and he looks. What does he see? He sees, to his horror, an Egyptian slave driver picking him there with his dreadful whip, beating this poor Hebrew slave. Instantly, uh, Moses is the fighter. Into the action he jumps. Is anyone looking this way? No, that way. Nobody's looking. A human sandstorm, a flash of his sword, and the Egyptian a slave driver lies dead in the sands. What a fighter. As Moses rightly or wrongly stands up for God's people. But he is a failed fighter. See, the failure of Moses the sun rises and Moses is on the construction site again. He seems to be warming to his task. This time it's a Hebrew beating another Hebrew. And he, he says to him, uh, why would you do that? Moses asks. But see the failure of Moses. Verse 13. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew?" The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? 
Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. Moses' attempt at being the all-action superhero was faster, was over, faster than the European Super League. He's rejected by his birth people, the Hebrews. Who made you ruler and judge over us? He's rejected by his adopted people, the Egyptians. Look at verse 15. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Moses is a failed prince, a failed rescuer, a right royal failure. How did he escape Pharaoh? Was he galloping on a camel? Did camels gallop? Or was he just running through the sand? We're not told. Uh, but how the mighty have fallen? Forty years in the palace, and now, again, the Bible says elsewhere, 40 years in the wilderness. 40 years eating desserts, now 40 years in the desert. A fighter, a failure, a foreigner. Look down at verse 16 with you. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. He's still a fighter. Still those rescuing instincts are there, driving away the aggressors, shepherding the flock. A failed Egyptian, a failed Hebrew, and now he must become a foreigner. He must start again. Can you see verse 21? Uh, glance down to verse 21. Moses agreed to stay with the man, that's the father of the, the shepherd girls, who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershon, saying, I've become a foreigner in a foreign land. Midian is in Arabia. Uh, the Midianites were distantly related to the Hebrews. But when Moses married one of those shepherd girls, Zipporah, and a newborn cries in their arms, they call him Gershon, because it means foreigner there. Foreigner there. See, by the time the prince of Egypt has finished in the desert, the Bible says he's 80 years old. And I guess he must think, what a failure. I guess he must think he's thrown away his life. Now, of course, that's not the end of the story. But let's just pause there. What do we see? What can we see as we look at our own lives? No doubt there have been great successes in your life, things to be very thankful for. But maybe we do also see failures, things that haven't turned out as we would have hoped they would. Maybe we failed in the way that we relate with others at home, or at work, uh, or at school, or in some voluntary capacity. Maybe we've tried to help somebody and they've rejected it. Maybe we're getting towards middle-aged or slightly older, and uh, we wonder, what have we got to show for ourselves? Maybe we've been praying about something for years, even decades, and, and where's the answer? Maybe we used to be very keen Christians and attempted great things for God. Maybe we've lost something of that, of that edge, that Christian enthusiasm, if we're honest. Friends, some of our failures may be sins. The Bible says we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And where we have sinned against God and others, let's repent. Uh, let's say sorry if we haven't already. And ask for God's Spirit to help us be more like the Lord Jesus. But other failures may not be our fault. What can we see? It might be easy uh, for perhaps a newcomer to look around this room and to think, well, they all look very sorted. They all look very sorted. Now, that can't be true because I'm not sorted. I'm a failure. And I take it we're here because by definition, in a sense, we're all failures. We need Jesus. 
So let's be careful what impression we give. Not to be desperate to give the impression that we are sorted. Uh, let's be a place where failures would know they're in good company. What can we see? We've seen first the failure of Moses. Uh, but like in those special pictures, is there a second picture alongside that? And there is. We've seen first the failure of Moses. Now secondly, it's faith. The faith of Moses. What can you see in our Bible reading? Well, you also see the faith of Moses. It's easy to see uh, Moses killing that Egyptian and running away and thinking, how stupid, how wrong. And yes, I guess it was rash. It was headstrong. I guess he should have asked for God's uh, direction. I guess as Prince, he could have found a less violent solution. But here is the shock. Uh, the Bible says Moses' action was an action of faith. If you have a Bible, turn, if you would, to the book of Hebrews. I'm going to turn to Hebrews, one of my favorite books. Hebrews sounds like it should be in the Old Testament, shouldn't it? It's not, it's in the New Testament. Hebrews, and chapter 11. Hebrews and... Uh, Hebrews 11 is a list of heroes of faith in the Old Testament. And it begins by defining faith in terms of what we see. It defines faith in terms of what we see. It says faith is confidence in what we hope for, and it is assurance about what we do not see. Assurance of what we do not see. Now Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 24 says this. By faith Moses... By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God, rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. What can you see in Moses' actions? Yes, failure, but also faith. By faith, Moses chooses to identify himself not as a palace prince, but with the persecuted people of God. He could have stayed in the palace, but he chose to go and see which people? What did Exodus say? He chose to go and see his own people, it says. Who did Moses, Moses identify with in the picture? Does he identify with the Egyptian with a stick or with a Hebrew on the sand? Exodus says with a Hebrew, one of his own people. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. That is faith. Friends, are we in love with the fleeting pleasures of sin? Or will we choose each day uh, to leave those fleeting pleasures and choose this day to follow Christ more deeply? Some of the things in a Christian's life which look to all the world like failures are, in fact, acts of great faith. Some of you have given up great careers to support Christian ministry or to care for your families. Some of you give up a night each week or your summer holiday to support a Christian mission or a young people's group. Some of you have given up years of your life to support a, maybe a loved one who's needy or to help someone who does. Some of you have given up your reputation to support a Christian ministry in your work or your school. It looks like failure, but it's faith. The faith of Moses, which led him to meet with God's people, to say, I'm one of you, to stick up for them, to serve them, even if that wasn't welcome, even if he didn't get it quite right every time. 
Friends, if we share Moses' faith, how can we share his experience of identifying with God's people? How can we show that we're standing with each other sacrificially? How can you and I show that on a Sunday? We're known as a welcoming church, I think, and we, I praise God for that. I praise God for you. But as the COVID rules relax, how can we keep welcoming each other beyond just the first couple of weeks? How can we show hospitality beyond a dinner party, uh, across culture, across class, across age and stage? How can we show that solidarity with Christians elsewhere? Maybe in our workplace or at school or uh, maybe on, in social media. Maybe some Christians get, get laughed at or worse. Or we keep our head down, hope that they don't notice we're also Christians. Or will we stand up for that Christian sacrificially? What about Christians persecuted abroad, suffering perhaps especially during this pandemic? And uh, I struggle with that because there's so much need out there and it's uh, so hard to know where to start. But is there maybe a, a, a mailing list to sign up to to hear about these persecuted Christians uh, or a regular gift to set up? Let's learn from the faith of Moses to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of this world. Now, why should we make those sacrifices? Why should Moses? Uh, why did Moses? What a crazy maverick. Why? Because Hebrews 11, verse 27. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Isn't that stunning? Moses saw him. He saw God who is invisible. What can we see? The faith of Moses helped him to see God who is invisible, and seeing God made him act in faith. How can we share the faith of Moses? We need God to open our eyes. We need to see who Moses saw. We need to see God who is invisible. See, there is a third perspective on today's episode, and this is not an optical illusion. There is a canvas behind the paint, and as the, the camera perhaps zooms out, uh, we see that as a trunk is similar to but greater than a twig, as a, as a tide is similar to but greater than a wave, so the, the faith of Moses points to the much greater faithfulness of God. And that's our third and final perspective, the faithfulness of God. Come back with me, please, to Exodus chapter 2. Exodus 2 and verse 23. Can you see it? During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And they cried for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned for them. What can we see? Sometimes we struggle to see what on earth is going on. We can't see what's going on. But God sees. God sees his people stumbling under the whip of their oppressors. God hears them gasping, driving out. God remembers his promises, his covenant to their ancestors. I'm grateful to Rachel for uh, showing us that. He remembers his promises. And God is concerned. Literally, he knows. He sees. See the faithfulness of God. Now you might think, why did God take so long to pay attention? Was he asleep before this? No. Remember last week we saw um, that God's been growing his kingdom for a very long time. You'll remember the first Christian master was Martyr. Sorry. The first Christian martyr was a man called Stephen in Acts chapter 7. And when Stephen was about to be stoned to death, he, he preached. And he preached about Jesus from the Old Testament. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen preaches about this moment when Moses kills the Egyptian. And he says this, Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them. But they did not. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them. But they did not. Yes, Moses may have been rash or hot-headed, 
But behind that, God was in charge, beginning the rescue of his people. Stephen said, was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute, and now you have betrayed and murdered Jesus? He didn't mince his words. Can we see the same, can we see the line there he drew between Jesus and Moses, and the rejection of both? Can we see the same faithfulness of God that God showed in Moses? He showed how much more in Jesus. Uh, Like Moses, Jesus left his royal palace. Like Moses, Jesus came down and identified with his people in the mud. Like they rejected Moses, uh, we rejected Jesus. John 1 says he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. Moses could only save exiles once he'd learned to be an exile. And Hebrews chapter 2 says about Jesus, since the children, that is us, Since the children have flesh and blood, Jesus too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Friends, how should we respond to the faithfulness of God shown in Jesus? Shall we respond like those Hebrews responded by crying? Crying out to God, crying in repentance for when we have rejected him. Crying for rescue, for rescue from slavery to this fear of death. If you've never done that before, would you make sure you've done that today? Cried in repentance, cried for rescue. Have a word with someone if you do that today. And crying for our world. I've been shocked this week to see the video clips of of the COVID crisis in some countries struggling much more in other parts of the world. The the, the gasps, the grief, the fires, the fear of death. Uh, Normally, subconsciously, I think I choose to take a slightly rose-tinted spectacles view of the world uh, as the way to cope with it, I suppose, and not to see the worst of the brokenness. But God's not like me. God sees. God sees the sickness. He sees, even worse than that, he sees the sin. He sees not only the death, he sees the judgment beyond. God sees. And God hears. And God is concerned enough to to get his hands dirty, to get stuck in, to be born as a baby in the manger in the person of Jesus. Let's cry for our broken world in this desperate time. And let's cry most of all for people to hear the good news of a faithful God, the good news of the Lord Jesus. Failure, faith, faithfulness. I had to giggle this week uh, when an obstacle illusion revealed the depths of my personality, my quirky, unique, creative, free spirit. But joking apart, what picture, what picture do we see as we look around? What picture will we see at home in our family tonight? What will we see tomorrow in the many and varied places where we'll see? Do we just see the circumstances of our lives? Or do we see with the eyes of faith God beyond? We need God's help for this, I think. We can't do it by ourselves. But he's good at opening eyes. Let's pray that as Moses saw the one who is invisible, as Stephen saw heaven opened, that God will open our eyes, grant us eyes of faith to see him and his great faithfulness. Before we sing, let me pray.